I'm Dr. Ethel Tungohan, an Associate Professor of Politics at York University. This is Academic Aunties. This week, we share with you the story of what happens when a community of academic aunties mobilize in support of a young girl who faced anti-Black racism. The story started when Bobby Wilson, a fourth grader from Caldwell, New Jersey, learned about the lanternflies that are destroying trees in her neighborhood. She wanted to do her part to protect the trees, so she learned about a homemade recipe that could eliminate the lanternflies without damaging them. She then set out to spray trees around her neighborhood to stop the infestation. But as is so common these days, this young, curious little scientist-to-be wasn't rewarded for her ingenuity. Instead, a neighbor called the police on this black girl saying to quote, I don't know what the hell she's doing. Scares me though, end quote. Thankfully, nothing tragic happened from the ensuing police interaction. And that's where it ended at the time. But that's where the Yale academic aunties came in. Dr. Iljoma Opera, a scientist at the Yale School of Public Health, saw the story on Twitter like many of us and was driven to do something for Bobby. Through her work on improving the lives and well-being of Black and Brown youth, she knew that interactions like these send the message to Black and Brown kids that they don't belong in the world of science. And Dr. Opara and the other amazing scientists she mobilized at Yale were determined to make sure that this wouldn't be the case for Bobby. They call themselves Bobby's Yale aunties, and I'm so pleased that a few of them have made time out of their beast schedules to tell us firsthand how their efforts came together. In this conversation, you'll hear from Dr. Opera and her colleagues, Dr. Ashley Bell and Dr. Kristen Carter. You'll also hear from Dr. Eileen Fernandez, who wasn't able to make the beginning of the conversation, but was able to join us near the end. So let's let the Yale aunties take it from here. Enjoy. It is such a big honor for me today to be with the Yale Aunties. For those of you who don't know, the Yale Aunties actually work together to make sure that Black female scientists, Black kids know that they have a place in science. And we'll have them tell the story because this is a story that's so heartwarming. It's been featured all over, including the New York Times. But before we get started, I'll have our aunties introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Ijoma Opara, and I am an assistant professor I'm here at Yale University School of Public Health, and I'm also the director of the Substances and Sexual Health Lab. And I guess I'm like the head auntie, right? I guess I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I guess I would say I'm the head auntie. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Welcome. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Ashley Bell. I'm an associate research scientist here at Yale University and the School of the Environment. I currently work in the Jet Seat Lab that's directed by Dr. Taylor. JETC is a very long acronym, but it stands for the Justice, Equity, Diversity, Sustainability Initiative. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kristen Carter. I'm a postdoc in the Horsley Lab and the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. I work on diabetic skin wound healing and whether or not we can incorporate biomaterials to alter the inflammatory response. Thanks for having me. It is such an honor, as mentioned, to have all of you here. So this this whole new story kind of explodes all over Twitter, all, explodes all over New York Times. And I'd like to hear from all of you how you first became aware of the story of this young child who was basically sanctioned, right? And who was basically policed. And I wanted to also hear about how all of you came together, how the head auntie brought all of you together to create like a mentorship circle <laughs> and how that came about. So I don't know, Dr. Apara, did you want to get started since you're the head auntie? Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. So I heard about the story back in November when it went viral, when Bobby's mom, and her sister were at a city council meeting, basically expressing to the mayor and, the, and city council members that her that, the, that Bobby, nine years old, was had the cops called on her because she was catching lantern flies. And I remember seeing that story on Twitter and it just broke my heart because this is actually my research focuses on black girls and their experiences with gendered racism and how this impacts health outcomes. So when I saw the story, I was immediately touched. I was outraged. And I put out a call on Twitter to ask someone to help me find the family because I wanted to invite the family to Yale to tour my lab. So at that moment, I was just thinking about having them tour my lab. I didn't necessarily know what that was going to look like, but I knew that I wanted to bring them to Yale 
to substitute this bad memory for a good one, for a good one with coming with Yale. And before doing this, I actually started an initiative, the Black Girls Go to Yale initiative, where I invite young Black teen girls from urban communities to come to Yale, to tour Yale, so they could see themselves in places like Yale. I want to be able to at least provide access and opportunity for girls to dream to be at a place like Yale, if they choose to be. So that was something that was really important to me. So after I put out the call, I immediately was connected to someone, his name is Jason, who just recently came in contact with the family. Then he encouraged me to talk to the mayor of Caldwell, which is where Bobby and the family live. And I reached out to the mayor, told him what I wanted to do. He responded to me immediately and connected me to the mom. So within like maybe two hours, I was connected to Bobby's mom. And I told her, I want to put together a tour, introduce you to other Black female scientists that are investigating insects and animals and have it be like a fun day. Mom was totally excited. She was on board. And to be honest, when I proposed that, I actually didn't even know what, how it was going to happen. But I just knew, like, I don't know if that was God. I just knew we were going to make this happen. So as soon as I got off the phone with her, we, we scheduled a day that we were going to, we were going to have the tour. The first person I reached out to was my, was the Associate Dean of Diversity at School of Public Health to see if I can get some swag, Yale swag to give to Bobby. And then I reached out to Kristen, to Dr. Carter and to uh, Dr. Eileen Fernandez. So I reached out to both of them. And the funny story about reaching out to Ashley, re- Ashley, Kristen, sorry, Kristen reached out to me a couple of, I think, weeks or months ago. And we were trying to schedule a time to meet, but it just never worked. And I confused Kristen with somebody who actually studies like um, like uh, insects. I don't know why I... I am not a bug person. So hearing that is the most I insane was like, thing. Yeah, I was like, oh, Kristen, do you study bugs? She was like, oh, no. Oh, I'm I'm so- <laughs> but, but. You took that away. I'm yeah, sorry. but I immediately said, you know, Kristen, like, I know we haven't met, but here's the link to the story. I'm inviting this girl and her family to Yale. Would you be available? Or do you know of anyone that's available, specifically someone that's Black, that could be a part of this tour? I really want this young girl to see other Black women. I don't care if they're students, postdocs, you know, professors, to just see other Black women who are in this space doing great work because Bobby deserves to be celebrated as a hero. Kristen was on point. I think she was at a conference. You know, I let her tell the story, but she was in the middle of like stuff. She was like, well, absolutely. I'll carve out time to do it. Anything you need. <laughs> yes, she came running from flight to flight yes. texting. Yes, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> so, she, so she was able. And then her and Eileen gave me some names of people we could reach out to. They also connected me to Dr. Ashley Bell. Ashley was like, absolutely. I'll be there. I don't even work in a, a lab with insects, but I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> I'd be like, great, you can make this happen. So within a day, we were able to make it happen. And then one of my, I told one of my students who also writes for the Yale Daily News, if she had any connections, because I knew she was in the science world. She, and she, and she told me while she doesn't work in, with insects, she has a close relationship with the Yale Peabody Museum because she used to intern there as a student. So she said, it would be great if we could possibly end the tour with Bobby going to the museum to see insects. I was like, oh my God, I would love that. So I reached out to the head of entomology at Yale Peabody Museum and immediately he responded saying, we have class during that time, but we'll carve out time for her. Like this story is really, it's really, it's really a tragic story. I love that you're doing this for this young girl. So please just, we'll carve out time in our, carve out some time in our schedule to bring her down to Peabody. So when we, the, the during the day when we all met, we all met in my lab and then we went over to meet with one, one another auntie who was now on the call, Ife, she's a PhD student. She was in the middle of giving a presentation, so she didn't have enough time to spend with us. But she did open up the doors for the lab that she works in for Dr. Bay's lab, who does work with mosquitoes. We thought that would be great to start the tour off with looking at mosquitoes. Bobby was really into it and stuff. Kristen was freaked out, but it was... <laughs> I was yeah, no way. I was a little freaked out, but I said, you're going to be strong for Bobby. I got to be strong. be strong. But Bobby was really excited about that. And then after that, we went over to, to, to Dr. Carter's lab to see mice. And that, and that ended up being the best part of the tour. <laughs> Believe it or not. Bobby loved seeing the mice. It was so fascinating yep. to see how into the mice she was. She even named the mouse. She named mm-hmm. Bob. She was so, <laughs> you know, about May that. May he rest in peace. Oh, gosh. No, we can't, yeah, we can't tell Bobby. We got to cut that I out. Know, we I know. Don't say that. <laughs> we can't tell Bobby. After we went to Dr. Carter, we spent a lot of time in, um, with Dr. Carter and the mice. And then from there, we went to um, Yale Peabody. 
And then it was at Yale Peabody when we met with the head, um, Dr. Gall and Nicole Kathy Maloney, I think her last name is. Both very great, sweet people. Um, they were, they're not Black, but, you know, they were very supportive in the efforts that we were doing. They recognized the efforts and they were very supportive in that. And it was there that they told Bobby, if you continue catching lanternflies, you can donate them to Yale Peabody and then whoever uses your lanternflies will cite you. And we were all the scientists. I don't think Bobby understood what that meant. We were like, all of us, like, what? That's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, huge. Her, yeah, I don't think Bobby and her family understood what Yeah, they were like, calm down. It's okay. Right? Okay. And we're like, we were like, this is a huge deal. <laughs> so I told the family, I said, if you guys make sure you mail, ship lanternflies to, to Yale, I'm going to throw a party for you. You're going to have a nice party. You're going to invite your friends and family. And again, I said this. I didn't even know how it was going to happen. But, but I knew, like, you know, <laughs> I had to make this happen. And so I told the mom. She was super excited. And then when I went back, spoke to my department chair, spoke to some people I'm at Yale, they were like, oh, absolutely. Whatever you need, Dr. O'Para, to make this happen, we'll support you. And then the rest is the rest is history. So I'll let, you know, Dr. Carter and Dr. Bell chime in with how they, with their own as to with how the day went. Yeah, you covered it really well, exactly what happened. I actually met Dr. Apar on Twitter when I was coming to Yale. You remember I DM'd you, I was like, hi, I'm not being weird or anything, oh, but yes, I'm coming to true. Yale. That's I love true. this. You were coming to Yale. Yeah, and I was like, do you want to make for coffee? And it was like six months of us emailing back and forth, just trying to get a coffee date. Yeah. And then it like never happened. And then we connected through Bobby's visit. I was like, oh my, I was starstruck. When I saw her, I was like, oh my God, she's so cool. She's so Thank cool you. and so smart. Right. It's just, Thank oh you. my God. Even, I know it was really about Bobby, but even for me, seeing Dr. O'Pair in her position was just so, oh my God. Oh my God. It was incredible. It was incredible. But yeah, back to Bobby. <laughs> I, I appreciate you both. Maybe you make me feel special. So thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah, I was drawn to Dr. Parr with her Dreamer Girls initiative about bringing girls in and creating a mentorship community. And I, coming to Yale from, I did my graduate training in Scotland. I didn't know anybody and I was really worried about the history of Yale being very exclusive. And so I was trying to essentially build my community through Twitter. And I came across the project and essentially DM'd Joma to no end. I was like, hello, hello. And, um, and, and yeah, and I met Eileen through the Yale Black Postdoc Association. She's one of the founders. I'm now the chair and Ash is also a member of YBPA. And it's been really great to have the community circle. And I don't think without that, we would have been able to pull this all together. It was really great. And what I loved about, I don't mean to, that, I don't mean to cut you off, Ashley, but what I loved about what happened the day that Bobby came is that we were, we're all super busy. Being at Yale <laughs> is, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful experience, but you have a lot it's of a lot. responsibilities. And, but immediately, once everyone heard the story about Bobby, people, mm -hmm. you know, were like, oh, we're going to carve out for this. Oh, even if right. I cleared my so, day. Um, yeah, yes. we're going yeah, to clear your day. So that just also yes. shows you the dedication that a lot of us here who identify as Black, even those who didn't identify as Black, just understand the importance right. of celebrating Black children and replacing that, 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 that bad memory with a good one just by being able to welcome her with open arms here. I don't really know what to add to all of this. I'll say similar to Dr. Carter, I first came across Dr. Opara on Twitter. It was just, I don't even know how it popped up in my timeline, but I came across her when she brought young Black women, young Black girls to um to Yale last summer. And as soon as I saw it, I went, OMG, I need to be a part of this. I need to meet this woman. This is what I want to do. <laughs> like, exactly. I was, but I didn't have that much courage as Kristen yeah. that took me to muster up the courage. Listen, the DM. power of the DM. I Do could, not I ever doubt like, it. How can I DM her <laughs> without sounding creepy? Like, yeah, I'm at Yale too. We should mm -hmm. meet up. I had mm -hmm. no idea to phrase it without sounding like a creep. So I just kind of stalked her on Twitter. <laughs> You're never which like creeping. Creepy. Which might be creepier, but that's what I do. Never a creep. Never a creep. <laughs> but but like Kristen said, I met Kristen through being in a YBPA, her and Dr. Fernandez. I met both of them through that. And honestly, being in YPA has really been great for me. Meeting meeting other Black um, scientists, all we're all in different fields, but but we all share a, a common a common experience. So it's really been helpful for me at Yale because I'm from South Florida. It is diverse as all outdoors down there. <laughs> 
Um, I went to an HBCU for my master, for my undergrad and master's. I did Tulane for my PhD, which is not as diverse, but my particular department was one of the more diverse ones. It was a com- it was a complete culture shock coming up here to Connecticut and to Yale. And it's never that I felt that Yale was out of reach. It was just something I never even thought about because I didn't see people like me or within my area doing this. So I think that's really why bringing Bobby up here and being able to be a part of that. So thank you so much, Dr. Aparo, for organizing this whole thing. And it was really important to me because I think a lot of times we only see what's within our four walls. And if you don't see anyone like you doing things, you don't even have the, you don't even, you don't know what you don't know. You don't even know to, to dream about doing something. So that's why this whole thing is really important to me. And I'm really happy and grateful that I was that I'm able to be a part of it. And any little bit that I can impart on someone, no matter how small, I'm really happy for that. Can I share a quick story, Ashley? First off, yes. thank, you. thank you both. And also there are other aunties that aren't on the call because there was a, there were a couple of students that came to the lab that I work with that in the beginning of the tour. And then there's Ambria, another who stayed with us the whole day, but she just gave birth. Shout out to Ambria and the baby, little baby son. Baby Remy. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the world, baby Remy. But I want to share a cute story about Ashley. So during the tour in November, there was some time between when we were done with the, when we were done with the tour, we were going to go to dinner. So we had maybe, I think, 30 minutes or so to spare because the mom, Bobby mom had to make a phone call. So we just all came back to my office to hang out. And my office was just me, Bobby, and Hayden, her 13-year-old sister. Hayden's on the phone doing her teenage phone stuff. And Bobby like, is like, she's, she wanted somebody to play with and talk to. So like Ashley came. And before I know it, her and Ashley were on like my board in my office, like figuring out math problems. <laughs> and so often, she was working with Bobby, was teaching her how to divide. It was so cute. It was she taught me Spanish. <laughs> wow. Yes, yeah. Bobby taught her Spanish. It was so cute. It was so cute. So thank you, Ashley, for being there. Because oh, I don't know. I think what I just did in office, I just said, Bobby, here, here goes some work. <laughs> That's like, like a kid with the crayons. On you go. To go to Barnett, like I paid for the right out. Well, no, thank you for entertaining her too. It was oh, really, no, really it great. was my pleasure. I'm not <laughs> playing with kids. <laughs> so, one thing that strikes me is that I think all of you were moved to make sure that Bobby's memories, that her experiences, were not marked by this horrible moment, right? That's why all of you mobilized, you cleared your schedules, you made sure that this happened. And I suppose my question to all of you is, did you have such role models growing up? What led you to pursue a career in science? One of the things all of you said was basically the common adage, you can't be what you can't see. So thinking about your own mentors, your own aunties, like what kind of led you to think this is something for me, which is what you do, what you did for Bobby. Now Bobby's thinking, I can also do this. This is within my reach. I'm actually getting, I'm getting published. I will be cited, right? If I send this, you know, and that's, that's a huge feat, right? For someone who's a kid. So just curious to see about the community that claims you and how your mentors, and if you've had mentors, how you got to where you are. I will say that uh, Bobby's age, I did not have. <laughs> I, did, I did not have what she has now. But I will say that the reason why I'm here today, I believe is because of my community. And my community of mentors looks different. I always knew that I wanted to have an impact on the world. And based on kind of my experiences and exposure to health disparities, um, both of my parents passed from from diabetes at young ages. So I just always knew that I wanted to do something related to health disparities, especially how it impacts Black people. As a, I was a youth and family therapist, so that also shaped my direction and really advocating and supporting youth as well too. But I also know because I do work in the community how important it is for people who experience the most disparities to be involved in these fields, to be involved in science, to be involved in public health. And a lot of times we're not involved because we don't see people that look like this. We don't even see that it's possible. Nobody tells us it's possible. So and so for me, I would say when I was a grad student, I had a Black woman, Dr. Awasan, who took, who not even, she wasn't even in my school. Like she was with somebody that I met randomly at an event. And I was like, oh my God, I want to get a PhD, but I don't know where to start. Can you help me? She had just got a PhD. And she was like, sure, absolutely. And this was after like several failed attempts of me reaching out to professors at my university. I need somebody to, I want to be on someone's paper. I want to get research experience. I can volunteer. You don't even got to pay me. 
And people either ignored me or they said, oh, you're not a good fit and blah, blah, blah. Those same people are now like, I'm a doctor for some reason. I'm just like, whatever. But anyway, well, that's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other episode. Shade, no facts. Dave, right? <laughs> they know themselves. They know themselves. Right. But I will always give credit to Dr. Awasan because she didn't have to take me un- under her wing. Like she didn't know me. I wasn't even in her university, but she just saw me as somebody, a Black woman who was ambitious, who knew what she wanted, but just needed that access, just needed that guidance and stuff. And she would sit with me every weekend at Panera and we were and we wrote our first paper together. And I was such a stubborn mency. I was like, oh my God, I don't feel like writing this paper. Oh my God, I'm so tired. And she was like, nope, we're going to meet every, sex, every Sunday until this paper is done. And then, it, and then in addition to that, she also encouraged me to get a PhD, helped me think about like how to craft my personal statement. And then I got into the PhD and, you know, it's just been the rest is history. So it was a Black woman that really opened up the doors for me and saw what's possible. And it's been a team of mentors that has gotten me to to where I am today, you know, and I just think about how much more could I have done if I started early, if I had this type of mentorship at nine years old or as a teenager, there's just so much possibility, but I'm, I'm grateful where I am now, but that is actually a motivation to me to be able to support young Black girls like Bobby, to be able to see that they can be not only us, they could even be better than us. That's my motivation. I think Professor Fernandez has joined us. Professor Fernandez, would you like to introduce yourself really quickly? And I just have one more final question. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I'm Eileen Fernandez. I am a cancer biologist by training. I did my PhD at Georgetown University. Before that, I did a master's in cancer biology prevention and control. So not only focusing on the biology of cancer, but also being in the community and looking at the epidemiology of it. My PhD work was focused in cancer health disparities and triple negative breast cancer, very science heavy, but focusing on the disparity that exists in cancers, particularly in a type of cancer called triple negative breast cancer that disproportionately affects Black American women. And then my PhD, my postdoc work was at Yale, where I went into the translational cancer space, looking at biomarker discovery development, really focusing on which patients should we be giving these cancer drugs that exist to and who should we not be giving them to so we can help improve their quality of life. Thank you so much for your introduction. And it's been so joyful hanging out with all of you, seeing how you all mobilized and came together in support of Bobby and how you've built this community of support at Yale. So one of the final questions, actually the final question I have is, why is it so important to have spaces, quote unquote, that are just for us? Why is it important to have an association? Dr. Fernandez, you were the chair of the Yale Black Postdoctoral Association. Why is it so important to have the space? And I ask that because, you know, I've curated my own spaces and the pushback I get is, aren't you being exclusionary? And for me, I'm like, maybe I'm just protecting what's sacred. So I'm one of the co-founders and I was the chair until through last year. And I love that you're asking that question because this is something, to be honest, until I was a postdoc, which at that point I've done my undergrad, I did a master's, I did a PhD. So I'm a little bit older. And it wasn't until I was a postdoc that I actually found scientists that looked like me. I'm Afro-Latina. I have a really short Afro. Never saw people that looked like me. Until I was a PhD student, did I not see a Black scientist for the first time. Um, And, you know, it was a a female scientist. So that was incredible. But becoming a postdoc... um, And, you know, the Black Post Association started in 2020 after the killing of George Floyd, where there was this nationwide reckoning and everything, the pieces fell into place where I met two other incredible Black women. And we all had this idea that we wanted to start a community at Yale. We wanted to have that place where you can go and find a home. And I have to say, as a postdoc, I never realized how much I needed that community until I finally had it. And I was like, oh, this is how people feel. Oh, this is the life that everyone's been living for years, I have never knew I, that I was missing this in this particular space because I had been in this science space for so long. So it's really just a, it's the need to have people who not only look like you necessarily will understand you a little bit. You don't have to code switch as much when you're with your people and they know the experiences you're going through. They know the microaggressions. I don't need to explain to someone or justify why I'm feeling offended because the person said that I took their spot in the lab or I don't need to I don't need to elaborate when I say that my science was messed with as a PhD student because they know what I'm talking about. You know, they're not saying, well, well, that's not because you're black, (laughs) you know, so it's a very different field to have that support. And you really like 
the sky's the limit, right? And you can really soar when you have that community and when you have the support. Yeah, I'll just piggyback. And even touching on your previous question about mentorship, I didn't have a Black professor until I was an undergrad. An undergrad. I had one Black man. Shout out Mr. Whitaker at UMass Amherst. I had Calc 2. Almost failed. Got C minus. <laughs> but anyway, he used to sit with me and help me go. So I really struggled with like math and science. And a lot of the career advice I was given was to leave. Leave science, leave math. And without Professor Whitaker, I definitely would have flunked out. Just being real about it. And he encouraged me to find other people, maybe not in STEM, but people that looked like me. And I had taken an independent study looking at the history of medicine as it plays a part in science or history of race as it plays a part in science medicine today and how racism is really embedded in how we function as scientists. And I worked with Dr. Luke Wilson at Mount Holyoke on and came across the story of Dr. James McCune Smith. He was the first African-American to earn a university granted medical degree and graduated from the University of Glasgow in 1837. And so you can imagine how me never seeing Black people in academia, finding one Black professor, finding another Black professor, and then finding out about Dr. McCune Smith, I was totally inspired and just completely revamped. And I ended up applying to the University of Glasgow for my master's and PhD. And for some reason, they let me in. Thank you, Glasgow. And um, yeah, I ended up making history myself as the first Black graduate. But but during my time at Glasgow, again, I was the only Black person all alone. And the only Black professor at Glasgow in Scotland is Professor Helen Minnis. She's one of, I think, less than 20 in the entire UK Black female professors, which is an insane thing to say out loud, considering how big and how full of universities the UK is. And so without pockets of people throughout my life, I would not be where I am. And you talk about being understood. When I experienced, you know, workplace harassment or discrimination or whatever, I didn't have to explain the racism behind the comments. All I had to do was just say, they told me they weren't ghetto enough to listen to Chief Keith. Instantly, they got it. Who doesn't like Chief Keith? But anyway, that's a different story. But I was in tears, in tears at just the relief I felt. People who understood me and heard me and didn't gaslight me or try and say, oh, well, don't rock the boat. You don't want to be seen as difficult or you don't want to struggle to make friends. I'm already struggling. I need help. And those people were really integral in me feeling supported and feeling safe. So I think the, in my experience, the Black-centered spaces for me is about safety. Just feeling okay to be myself, as Eileen said, not having a code switch, just letting my hair out, which I never, ever wear my hair out, but I do wear my hair out at YBPA events. And that's something I definitely keep in at the workplace. So it's just being my authentic self, especially. Yeah, honestly, I didn't realize how important spaces like this were until I started my PhD program. And I think that's because one, growing up in South Florida, they're extremely diverse. Now, my my particular, the programs that I was in, like through grade school, those weren't diverse. Like, I think it was six of us, that six Black people that were in my middle school. And then us same six went to the same high school, the same program, but the school itself was extremely diverse. And then I went to FAMU in Tallahassee for my undergrad and my master's in HBCU. So I saw an abundance of Black people in academia. I had an abundance of Black professors. Some were extremely hard. Like Kristen, I barely passed science, organic chemistry. I literally oh my God, it. Orgo, I failed I, twice. We barely I, made it, okay? I, I, I was like, listen, just I'm like, I've already told my mom that I'm graduating. So like, you just need to give me a D. So like, I, I'm Please just release me. <laughs> definitely use this stuff again. But I was always around Black people that were, or Black students and things that were doing advanced degrees. Most of my girlfriends that I went from middle school, high school, college, all of them have, have advanced, have, have advanced degrees and stuff. So I've always been surrounded by that. So I never felt the need to create a community because I was already a part of one. But when I went to Tulane and I no longer had that, that's when I realized how important it is to be around people that look like you, that speak like you, where like everyone said, you don't have to code switch. You don't feel like you always have to act in a certain way or speak a certain way to be accepted. You could just be you. Um, and I really encountered that when I went to Tulane. Because like I said, our department was diverse, but the school itself is not. You could literally be on the undergrad camp campus and walk and not see another Black person. And when you do see them, you can nod because you both know 
the field. And then definitely then moving up here, one, not ever living in the Northeast, not knowing what to expect. It's really also when it's sank in, how important it is to be around people that just understand you and that accept you on days when you're happy and on days when you're just not so much happy. I, I'm very, it's at the end, and I agree with, with Dr. Carter that creating spaces like this is for my safety and for me just to remain mentally stable, you know, and, and be, you know, and, and be able to be Ashley. That's beautiful. Thank you all so much. One super, super last question. I'm going to sneak it in. A lot of our listeners contact us, contact me on the pod saying, I'm starting my PhD. I'm one of the onlys. It's just been really hard. And I get a lot of these emails actually from people in the sciences. I'm in the social sciences, but it's specifically the sciences where a lot of folks feel isolated. What quick words of wisdom, quick words of advice would you give to these listeners? I mean, I said it before, Twitter. I think Twitter is the best network. That's how I met Yujioma. And it wasn't creepy that I DM'd her and we're friends now. And it, sometimes it turns out okay. Sometimes people don't respond. But like, for me, if you look at my Twitter, it's a mix of like chaos and academia. Gotta have both. But you see so many Black scientists, international. And my network has grown. And I think Twitter is the best way to connect people to see yourself and be able to speak honestly in comforting spaces. But also if you can find people, if you're in the sciences like myself, you can find people who are in social sciences or in, in the med school, just anywhere. They don't have to be in, in your field, in your department. Just try and make friends with whoever you can find that you think would understand. I think that's the most important thing. I was going to say the same thing as Dr. Carter. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Uh, Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> Definitely networking. Put yourself out there. I know it's so uncomfortable, but just do it. There are like the Black in groups. So there's like Black in cancer, Black in neuro. So that's like for very science heavy, but it's all just Google Black in X. And they actually ha have done the great job of putting us all into one group that <laughs> so you can find the 80 groups that exist and you can start connecting with those groups. And they do programming from like undergrad all the way up, depending on the group. That's a really great way. I, I Like I said, Twitter was, I was like, oh my God, there's so many black scientists. These people look like, and they're all, I know, I'm like, where are they hiding? Hello. <laughs> and that's the best thing too, right? Because that's one of the things we're always hearing is, but we can't hire any black people because there's, there just aren't any people who are good and who are in. And it's like, actually, <laughs> love that voice have, you did. We have the receipts, actually, that we do exist. But yeah, definitely those type of groups are out there. I do want to give a shout out to Cohort Sisters. If they just Google that, that's a group that exists. And specifically, I think they started around the pandemic for PhD students to be able to connect. So I want to plug that. I'm slightly older. So Twitter was not my go-to <laughs> um, Facebook clip. <laughs> Um, but Facebook is what I use and what I, and, but now with the new generation, yes, Twitter, probably TikTok would be a good mechanism to Google things to figure out where, you know, where you can find community. And even though it isn't like an extrovert, you know, so I know it might be hard for some people just to step out there. But usually when you put yourself in uncomfortable situations, they tend to pan out for the most part. So that's, that would be my, my advice to anyone who wants to get into any type of field is to one, Believe that you can do it. And even if you have to be the first, somebody got to do it. Hey, why not you? And realize that you really can find support anywhere. It can be not, it could be your family. It can be a friend or whatever. It, support doesn't have to look a certain way. So that would just be my overall suggestion is that um, you, you can do it. It might be hard, but you can do it. These are beautiful words of advice. Dr. Opara, did you want to give the final okay. word, final bits of advice? Yeah, yeah, sure. I was just going to agree with what everybody was saying. I think the most important thing, whether you want to use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email to um, snail mail, right, finding, your, <laughs> finding your community is huge. I was someone that I wasn't the only black PhD student in my cohort, but I still felt isolated, too. So that's another thing to add. You could still have black people in your space and still not feel welcome, you know, too. Like people, I think, assume once you see Another black person, you're not supposed to be besties, but that doesn't always happen because we're so nuanced. We're so our personalities may not clash. And while well, I was saying, I didn't necessarily have personality clashes with the black PhD students in my cohort. We just didn't. We just didn't. We just didn't mesh well. We didn't have the time to really support each. We didn't have that space to really come together. But I did have those spaces outside of my department. Too. I was a part of a lot of different PhD student programs and networking programs. I went to conferences a lot. So it was in those areas that I was able to meet people that are now part of my 
community and part of my like academic family. So I think as for just to round it up for a Black PhD student or Black college student or whoever, being in this space may be isolating because you are doing impactful cha- you know, work. These spaces weren't meant for us. So it's no wonder a lot of us aren't comfortable. So it's, but it's important to know that the way you're feeling, there's somebody out there that felt exactly the same way and they have the blueprint. You know, you just have to just find them too. I get so many emails from students and I feel bad because I, my, in, my inbox is insane. So just know for, but I was that student that was always emailing people, like emailing superstars in my field. I look back at them, like, I don't know why I thought they were going to respond to me. <laughs> you know, but there, out of all the emails, like out of 10 emails, at least one person will respond. So don't give up. Keep emailing, DM, you know, your your peers, your colleague, potential mentor, somebody will respond and you'll find your community. <laughs> These are such inspiring words to end on. I think a lot of her listeners will derive a lot of strength and inspiration from all of you. So Thank you very much. I really appreciated this. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Aparo because without you having the vision to do all of this, we would not be here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you all. Uh -uh, Take the flowers. Take the flowers. flowers. Uh (laughs) We're not going to do that. Take the flowers, please. No, thank you. No, thank you all too. And I appreciate it. Shout out to Bobby. Bobby. Love you, Bobby. Bobby is a hero. (laughs) She is a hero. I, I adore her and her mom and her sister and her dad. They're amazing. So, yes. so, so thank So I'll shout out to them as well. Doctors Opara, Bell, Carter, and Fernandez, and all of the Yale aunties remind me why we do this podcast. The work of mentorship, community building, and bringing to the forefront the voices of marginalized academics is so important, even though it's labor that is never really recognized by the academy. We need spaces to be ourselves, to find solidarity and connection with those who get that our experiences are not the same as those who have been traditionally represented in academia. We're so grateful for those like Dr. Opera and her Yale anti-crew who stepped up and showed us why these systemic structures of exclusion need to be broken down. And that's Academic Antis. After a run of 16 episodes this season, we're going to take a bit of a break. For the next few weeks, I'll be heading to England for a fellowship. But don't worry, we'll be back soon. If you want to make sure you know when we're back, make sure to subscribe to Academic Antis on your favorite podcast app. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at, at Academic Anti. On Mastodon, you can find us at Academic Antis at maz.to. And send us an email anytime at podcast at academicantis.com. Thank you to everyone for all the support that you've given the podcast. If you like what you heard, give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts and let others know about the podcast. This is a labor of love. We do not get outside funding other than the support listeners give us. To help fund our production costs, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter or buy some of our awesome Academic Anti swag. Visit us at academicantis.com slash support for more ways to help us produce more episodes. Today's episode of Academic Antis was hosted by me, Dr. Ethel Tungohan, and produced by Dr. Nisha Nath and Wayne Chu. Tune in next time when we talk to more Academic Antis. Until then, take care, be kind to yourself, and don't be an asshole.